Good morning. I'm Leslie Rosenthal. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Juilliard School. I absolutely love this program. It is my 10th year uh, chairing this breakfast, and it is my great privilege and honor to welcome you here today. Welcome to our Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Center for Elder Justice 10th Annual Awards of Distinction Breakfast. What a joy to be able to gather together today in person. I hope you and your families have weathered these past two years of unprecedented change and challenge with good health and safety. What has not changed is the dedication and contribution and leadership of the Weinberg Center for those experiencing elder abuse. The center's pioneering and innovative work is a premier model in our city and our state, indeed the country and internationally. Their voice is a beacon for the most vulnerable. We are privileged to celebrate this 10th anniversary breakfast on today, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. It was launched by the International Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse and the World Health Organization at the United Nations in 2006. This state challenges each of us to promote a better understanding of abuse and neglect for older adults and reminds us to raise awareness of the issue. It's fitting that we congratulate our honorees today, two distinguished voices for justice. Dr. Terry Fulmer, President of the John A. Hartford Foundation. And the Honorable Tanya R. Kennedy, Associate Justice, Appellate Division, First Department. It's so good to be here with you today and to meet your families and your colleagues. As you will hear, each has an individual and palpable connection to the Weinberg Center. It is now a great pleasure for me once again to introduce Jeffrey Maurer, the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Hebrew Home at Riverdale. Leslie, uh, let me echo your sentiments. It is indeed a privilege and a delight to be here together in person. I have to read from paper. I don't look at the teleprompter in front of my Zoom. I have to say this is the 10th anniversary and my font size gets larger every year. <laughs> Leslie, thank you for your many years of partnership with us. We really appreciate it. Let us also give an enormous thank you to Blank Rome for their generosity in hosting this morning's breakfast, especially, especially to Marilyn Chinnitz, a partner. Marilyn is our 2021 Last year we needed to pivot to a virtual breakfast, and for those who might have missed it, Marilyn truly gave an impassioned and powerful remarks about elder abuse and how it can insidiously touch all families. Please listen to it later by clicking the QR program, the QR code in your program. I'm sure all of you are technologically uh, capable of doing that. You'll truly be inspired. It was a wonderful speech. 17 years ago, Joy Solomon, our director and managing attorney of the Weinberg Center and vice president of elder justice and spiritual engagement at River Spring Living, together with Dan Reingold, our CEO and president. Dan, please stand and be recognized. They together recognized and answered the need to attack the epidemic of elder abuse the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Center for Elder Justice was born. I am deeply proud to be chairman of an organization that has galvanized an ever-growing and deepening shelter movement that understands the issues surrounding elder abuse require a large-scale effort for real change. 
Today, you will learn about the ever-increasing scope of legal, trauma-informed care and services, educational trainings, and the leadership of the superior team at the Weinberg Center. Please watch the video on your screens. I was a prosecutor in the Manhattan DA's office for almost a decade. There weren't that many prosecutors interested in the older person as a crime victim. And one of the things that I saw was that there was no shelter for older people if their home was unsafe. There was a gap in service for the shelter component for an older person who may be victimized at home and who needed supports and then a bridge back into community. I was on a board where I met the CEO here, Dan Reingold, and together we came up with the idea of creating a shelter intervention program within a skilled nursing home. There is medical care, therapeutic care, all the things that might be necessary to help an older person heal. We would bring legal expertise and therapeutic expertise that was really trauma-informed. When the abuse is of a severity that the person is clearly not safe at home, then you're looking at a situation that becomes very complicated. What is it that, with respect to this person, what does this person need? Is it medical care? Is it assistive devices? There are answers. We just have to understand what it is that our clients need and know how to tap into those systems. Because of the trauma they've experienced, and so often, especially if they've experienced abuse at the hands of a family member, we're talking about years of incidents and abuse, and so a lot of our role is just educating clients on the truth of what are the different options that are afforded them? People, when they, they hear the word shelter, they think of, you know, homeless shelters or domestic violence shelters and may not necessarily realize that there is a place and a need for elder abuse shelters as well. And we can band together and say, let's get something done for this person who otherwise nobody might be paying attention to. By the time somebody gets to the Weinberg Center, they're in a situation that really has reached a crisis level. Functional domains have sort of collapsed in on each other. So when we think about the systems that are in play, we have court systems, the systems of benefits and entitlements, the human services systems like adult protective services, and then we also have medical systems. And so all four of those interplay with one another and the way that we act in one arena will impact the benefits and entitlements and options that are available in the other arenas. All of these threads touch and impact what we can do legally for our clients. The systems are struggling to catch up to be relevant. So I think we're dealing with all of that. That's one of the things that's so incredible just about the elder abuse shelter model is that it means that you can, in some ways, bypass those systems as an immediate response. I think one of the best things to do is to take a team approach and build relationships so that when you are navigating a difficult system, you have somebody that you know on the other end of the line that you're talking to. There's a very vibrant network of connections and resources that people at the Weinberg Center can turn to when they're trying to solve a problem. Well, I'm very involved with our Spring Alliance initiative, which is our community of professionals around the country who are operating shelter programs similar to ours. Making sure that there's a way to, to meet whatever the community need is uh, really important and something the Spring Alliance has provided support for over 20 shelter sites over the last decade or so. Elder abuse can really only be addressed effectively when multiple systems and multiple professionals from those systems work together and strategize together. I think we're really at the cusp of deep understanding on the part of our elected officials and government that shelter for older people is a necessary part of community. The clients have to lead the way. They're the ones that are the experts in what they're ready for on their own timeline and, and empower them and support them in, in the way that they want to move forward. It's not acceptable that older people would be devalued and marginalized and that their safety would not be a priority. 
I see it as fundamentally hopeful work. Them coming here is them saying, no, I still have time. I still have ability to make change. I can still enjoy this moment and the freedoms that it affords me. The Weinberg Center has made a big contribution in that way of saying, let's have each other's backs. Let's not be strangers. Let's notice, does this older adult seem safe? I can put that down on the frame of every single client we've ever had here. Close to 200,000 days of shelter. That it's true, they've come here because of something terrible, but we have the chance, we have the opportunity to help ourselves and help them you know, see that which is beautiful. social unrest in the late 1960s, a time of a fractured union, great violence and anxiety, and a yearning for peace. Give Me Shelter is the great plea that's still heard around the world. What is shelter? Shelter is the metaphorical equivalent of love and safety, not just a roof over someone's head, but a way of being. Shelter is both the figurative, space to make personal choices, and the literal, space that offers protection. At the Weinberg Center for Elder Justice, shelter is a range of holistic, person-directed, trauma-informed services designed to help older adults remember who they can be. Raquel was born in Honduras in the late 1930s. She met her husband, Samuel, an American tourist, while he was on vacation. A petite and dark-skinned woman, Raquel left her family in Honduras and moved with Samuel to the Upper West Side, where his family of doctors had lived for a generation, themselves having emigrated from Minsk 30 years earlier. Raquel's work was to raise their only child, Iris. Raquel's world was small but comfortable, never learning English fluently, always aware of her immigrant identity. Her husband Samuel died at age 47 when Iris was 15, deep in the throes of adolescence and exhibiting unusual rage and volatility. Two things matter to Raquel, Iris and her rent-controlled apartment. Housing insecurity impacts every aspect of a person's life particularly immigrants struggling to understand the interlocking systems of law and culture. In New York City, one third of renters are severely rent burdened, meaning that they spend more than 50% of their income on rent. 
Iris is extremely smart and prone to anger and outbursts, unable to maintain stable relationships. She survives by outsmarting people and systems. Despite her behaviors, Iris receives a full scholarship to college and immediately following entrance into a prestigious medical school. Contact with her widowed mother is sporadic and vacillates between tenderness and cruelty. In her important book, Difficult, Mothering Challenging Adult Children Through Conflict and Change, Professor Judy Smith, who's our guest here this morning at our breakfast, writes, you don't stop being a mother just because your kids are grown. Mothers are society's shock absorbers, filling the gap eternally and with minimal support when systems fail. She says you can divorce a difficult spouse, but it's much harder to give up on a difficult child. Kate Bowler, an associate professor at Duke Divinity School, echoes this sentiment in her wonderful book, No Cure for Being Human. She says, this is a burden of a mother's love, how it must hover without landing. Iris graduates from medical school, finishes her residency with a job and a husband, two children follow, and then a divorce. Needing help, she returns to her mother's apartment, two small children in tow. Living alone is a risk. Cohabitation, too, is a risk when your housemate is dangerous. Mental health diagnoses can be heartbreaking for families. Lack of a diagnosis can be equally shattering. Without a name, a treatment plan, professional support, or community, families of those with significant and untreated mental health problems suffer in silence and often alone. Even when the person can function in the world, like Iris, a physician who's treating patients, the breakdowns and the abuse often occur in the four walls of home. The world's assumptions about what a perpetrator looks like are well-intentioned but misguided notions about education, class, age, and occupation, and what they signal can become the most dangerous weapons of all. Iris and her children become known to city agencies and services, and her medical license is suspended. In the apartment, now a luxury building with new wealthy neighbors and new rules, Raquel is trapped between personal safety and the suffering of her family. Would you trade your safety for your children or grandchildren? Does it matter that your difficult child is now an adult? Raquel does not possess community, a network of professional resources, or the language to speak about her daughter's mental health issues and has never known who to talk to. She is sick in her mind are the words that best describe her understanding of what is occurring. In 2016, Iris and her children move away again, disappearing. Raquel is paralyzed with grief and shame, but also deeply relieved. In early 2020, Raquel turns 84 years old. She has degenerative arthritis, vulnerable to falling, and concerned about long-term mobility. A week after her 84th birthday, the pandemic shuts everything down. Raquel becomes a prisoner in her apartment. She is alone for 471 days. COVID has been devastating, even fatal for many community dwelling older adults in New York City. The heart-wrenching loneliness experienced by older adults is now considered a serious medical condition, akin to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. During COVID, one out of five Medicare beneficiaries were unable to access health service. Two out of three older adults experience financial challenges, which are directly linked to adverse medical, mental health outcomes. Older adults who were quarantined or locked down with family members or caregivers faced higher risks of violence, abuse, and neglect. In New York City, older adults also faced age discrimination, decisions on medical care, triage at hospitals, and end-of-life decisions making in an end of life decision making. In fact, most services were shut down. Technologically limited older people were without even the most basic connection. A soon to be published law review article authored by the Weinberg legal team 
highlights the significant disparities of older adult wishes and values and end of life decisions made on their behalf as surrogate decision makers. In the fall of 2020, 2021, COVID still raging, Iris and her two children, now nine and 11, moved back in with Raquel, who's now 85 years old. Chaos ensues. The children are schooled from home, and Iris, whose medical license has been reinstated, is doing telemedicine from the bedroom. Iris limits Raquel's kitchen and bathroom usage, takes her cell phone, and acts physically aggressive toward her without warning. Iris uses the children as weapons, demeaning her in front of them, saying, we don't like you. Loneliness becomes fear. With no other available options, Raquel walks into Mount Sinai's emergency room. Care for non-emergent patients is scant, but a kind-hearted, Spanish-speaking social worker interviews Raquel, who at first describes pain in her leg, but then discloses that her real concerns are her living situation with a daughter who behaves roughly toward her. The social work team keeps Raquel overnight, making numerous attempts to contact Iris. When she finally answers the phone, she identifies herself as a physician, saying her mother has been exhibiting increasingly erratic and aggressive behavior, wandering outside while inappropriately dressed, screaming at the walls and in the building box. Using her medical knowledge of how dementia manifests, Iris describes this behavior as getting worse later in the day. She also alludes to Raquel having a pain pill addiction, describing her mother as taking too many medications and acting violently when Iris attempts to interfere. We see this phenomenon, one manifestation of ageism often. Adult children or caregivers speaking for the older adult who's in the room or the subject of the discussion as if invisible. Iris's education, knowledge of medical jargon and systems, and well-spoken English could easily translate to credibility at Raquel's expense. But the Mount Sinai social work team, having observed Raquel for more than 24 hours, have seen no signs of cognitive impairment or erratic behavior. Iris's descriptions and her attitude resonate as the red flags that they are. Raquel decides she wants to go home. She returns to the apartment, but Iris won't let her in. Having developed a rapport with the hospital social worker, Raquel calls her and the social worker insists that Raquel call the police. Police officers, also unable to enter the apartment, take Raquel back to the hospital. <clears throat> In the Rand Corporation's initial evaluation of the Weinberg Center, vignettes demonstrated the cost efficacy of shelter <coughs> as a necessary intervention in the scourge of elder abuse. In this case, like many illustrated in the Rand report, multiple expensive systems are utilized repeatedly. Without effective intervention, there is little hope for safety or stabilization. Our current federal innovation grant also aims to prove the obvious merits of shelter. We see our work in part as focusing on big systems that have impact on all older adults, like the courts, adult protective services, hospitals, guardianships, palliative, and end-of-life care. As pioneering leaders in the field, we have created tools and resources designed for both use on a state and national scale. And as Jeff mentioned, if you um, click on that QR code um, on the donor insert, you'll see all of those materials. Our national work also includes the Spring Alliance, our expanding professional network of shelters across the country. The Spring Alliance is entering its 10th year with 20 partners in 18 states. We also see our work as individualized and direct, explicitly tailored to each client's wants and needs. From the hospital, Raquel agrees to come to the Weinberg Center. She is greeted on arrival by our elder justice specialists who ensures her that they will figure out the way forward together. Raquel also receives medical and rehabilitation services. It's not vodka. <laughs> um, 
I cannot honor, excuse me, I cannot discuss the critical work of the Weinberg team without honoring their dedication during COVID. This team of legal and social work professionals became mandatory healthcare workers overnight. They, alongside the very dedicated Hebrew home staff, professionals and leadership have shown up every day, leaving their own safe shelters. And we thank you. After numerous discussions with our multidisciplinary team, Raquel feels sufficiently safe to disclose the secret of the severe and long physical abuse she has experienced at the hands of her daughter. Through trauma-informed legal and social supports, a strategy unfolds. Together, Raquel and the team believe an arrest and a resultant order of protection are the surest way for her to return home safely. Weinberg professionals assist her toward this goal. An arrest is made and eventually she returns home. Our transitional social worker visits Raquel weekly for 12 weeks to, report, to support her safe return. In this moment of history, Gimme Shelter is just one of many urgent issues of our time. Alongside gun violence, reproductive rights, racism, housing, income, and environmental insecurity, and staggering rates of mental illness. It can certainly feel overwhelming, and I think grief and resignation live side by side for many of us. In his famous sermon of 1967, at the same time that the Rolling Stones were singing Gimme Shelter, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was preaching. He said this, it really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So in this very challenging time, where do we begin for ourselves to make a difference? First, I want to suggest that you give yourself permission to practice self-care every single day. And second, um, consider what matters most be an elder justice champion if that's what calls to you. And if not, find your purpose. Whatever it is, big system overhaul or small acts of kindness, use your energy, time, and attention toward that. Every act of repairing and healing the world supports everything else. This interconnection is unshakable. I believe that if each of us takes on the cause that matters most to us, this will ultimately impact older adults for good. Thank you so much. that was so moving as always thank you so much dr. Terry Fulmer brilliant career from its beginning has been a hundred percent focused on the health and the dignity and the well-being of older adults the Weinberg Center has loved you dr. Fulmer for a long time Long before she was president of the John A. Hartford Foundation, she was meeting Dan and Joy in the wee hours of the morning in diners. Hopefully on Long Island, just saying. Sketching out plans for the shelter on a diner napkin. These diner meetings also included Dr. Fulmer's insights on why elder abuse screening is necessary and possible in all healthcare settings. And she made another original napkin sketch on the screening questions most important to ask. These diner napkin questions form the basis 
of what became their validated screening tool. Dr. Former's credentials are incredible, and I hope you will look at the bio on the printed program if you haven't already. You will see the clarity of her personal mission and vision dedicated to improving the care of the older adults. As a nurse, distinguished professor, and dean, the recipient of hundreds of awards, and a frontline leader in developing the next generation of leaders in elder mistreatment across the nation. Her impact on the ways the public views older adults, on systems and practices to better the care of older adults in hospitals, in emergency rooms, in long-term care communities, and on developing those screening tools to ensure the prevention of mistreatment and elder abuse for adults. It's revolutionary. We are indebted to Dr. Fulmer's foresight, her groundbreaking research, her indomitable leadership, her clear and far heard voice on behalf of the advancement of quality care for older adults. The awards this year are particularly special to the Weinberg Center's team as they are truly the perfect vehicle to publicly demonstrate our gratitude for two champions. I quote from Dan Reinbold, my hero. Mm -hmm. She was the first person we consulted when we envisioned developing a shelter for older adults experiencing abuse and embedding it in our Hebrew home at Riverdale, Dan Reinbold recalls. Now together, we are a team in spirit, thought, and action, and have fought for change in conventional attitudes of older adults, for elder justice, and for the prevention of abuse of older adults. It is with the utmost privilege and honor that we award Dr. Terry Fulmer, our friend, our colleague, and our partner, the Champion of Change Award. such a pinnacle recognition of my career. Affirmation of what I knew from the first day I began my nursing career. Elder abuse is real and there are solutions like the groundbreaking Wine Group Center, which I have followed since its inception. And it's a privilege to be honored alongside Justice Tanya Kennedy, a remarkable champion for justice. Pleasure with a mother daughter, mother daughter team today. So that's really lovely. This is a defining experience today and an award that I accept with deepest humility. Dan and Joy, I love you. And your tireless efforts on behalf of the older residents you serve and those in the greater community of older adults in this city and in this nation. They deserve loving care and justice, and that is really at the center of everything you do, and I thank you for that. When I'm with you, I am constantly reminded of your father, Jacob, and the early influence he had on the way I thought about skilled nursing facilities. I was then in Boston, and Jacob invited me to come and consult on his developing plans for elder abuse programming. As I arrived in Riverdale, my eyes were open to a whole new set of possibilities of what a nursing home could look like, as well as what it could offer. His influence stays with me today. This recognition gives me a brief moment for reflection on my career. In my early practice, I found myself drawn to the older patients, many who had survived their cardiac resuscitation or their chemo but they were then left with functional decline, and worst of all, they were suffering. This sparked my passion for geriatrics. In 1978, when the first mandatory reporting law 
was passed in Boston, in Massachusetts, for suspected abuse and neglect reporting. I was asked by the renowned physician, Dr. Mitchell Rabkin, who was then the CEO of the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, to lead our organizational response to the law. And it began my lifelong commitment to eradicating elder mistreatment. The first book I ever published was with Terry O'Malley, a physician in Boston, in 87, entitled Inadequate Care of the Elderly, a Healthcare Perspective on Abuse and Neglect, because in those days it was thought to be a legal problem only. That early work has come full circle with my presidency at the John A. Hartford Foundation, a national philanthropy dedicated to improving the care of older adults, no matter where they are and no matter who's providing that care. The money from our philanthropy is from the great Atlantic and Pacific tea companies, a &P grocery stores. Yeah, I know. And John and George Hartford left their money for that cause to do the greatest good for the greatest number. In the 1980s, the trustees took a bold move and said, this foundation will focus on aging, and we are one of few in this country that does so. Today, we fund major elder abuse initiatives, including the Elder Mistreatment Collaboratory, led by EDC, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and that group has developed elder treatment screening approaches for emergency departments around the country. I'm most proud of our support for the Weinberg Center and the funding for an evaluation of the Weinberg Center's innovative shelter model. The evaluation, Joy mentioned by Rand, has been a critical step in advancing replication of the model and reducing elder treatment across the nation and probably around. Congratulations and gratitude to everyone at the center. Where's my center group? Over here. there. Uh, for your vital leadership. <laughs> and thank you to your trustees for their unwavering support. Not every set of trustees does the same. I also want to recognize the John A. Harper Foundation trustees and staff who have done so much to improve care for older adults through their thoughtful grant making well over $600 million to the field. Marcus Escobedo, where's Marcus? There he is, hi Marcus. <laughs> Our foundation's health communications is here with me today and a true partner in this work. Especially meaningful, my beautiful daughter, Holly. is here with me today. Holly is a nurse and proud employee of the River Spring team. And if that doesn't say it all, it <laughs> I watched with horror as the pandemic hit our nursing homes and those around the country and lived through the experience through her day-to-day -day practice as a nurse in your organization. It was awful. I saw in her eyes the exhaustion, the fear, and the resolve that every member of your team experience as they work valiantly under the worst circumstances to ensure quality and safety for your residents in what we hope will be the last pandemic in our lives. It is not over. These staff are still tired. We have to heal the choice. To everyone in the audience honoring the Weinberg Center, thank you for your continuing and ongoing support. We all have a role in promoting elder justice and eradicating elder mistreatment as a part of spreading age-friendly care around the world. Thank you for this great honor.
we didn't name the people in the Lambert Center, so I would really like to do that right now. Um, so if you're part of the Lambert team, please stand up here at your lap. Tanya R. Kennedy is the quintessential leader in service for the public good. If you Google exceptional jurist, you will find a photo of Justice Kennedy. Her intelligence, determination, and dedication to justice, and the encouragement of judicial service and access to justice for all is well known and deeply respected. Judge Kennedy was appointed in July 2020 as an Associate Justice of the Appellate Division, First Department. It was in Supreme Court, specifically in Article 81 guardianship proceedings, that Judge Kennedy and the Weinberg legal team came to know one another. Their mutual respect quickly developed. Overseeing complex and sensitive cases, Judge Kennedy employed her intellect, her reason, her overriding sense of fairness and humanity. Deirdre Locke, the Weinberg legal team's assistant director and general counsel says, and I quote, Judge Kennedy, with creativity, deep thought, and intelligence, emphasized the importance of communication within the criminal justice system, especially in cases involving elder abuse. As a proponent of service to the community, Judge Kennedy is equally engaged in education and in encouragement of judicial and public service. As an adjunct professor, she taught a juvenile justice seminar at Fordham University Law School for 10 years. She has also served in leadership roles on numerous committees, particularly in advancing women in the law. Trailblazer, inspiration, diversity leadership are the titles of but a few of the multiple awards that Judge Kennedy has received for her fierce involvement in committees and organizations that increase or expand members of the public and the judiciary in issues of fairness and justice. It is our great honor to present Judge Tanya R. Kennedy with the 2022 Champion of Justice Award. Good morning. thanks to Blank Home LLP for hosting us, but particularly my fellow Cardozo alum, <laughs> new friend and fellow hot sauce <laughs> and coffee, and may I add, fashion fan, <laughs> Marilyn Chen. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, second, I, I want to acknowledge two colleagues who I know are elder justice champions. Uh, the Honorable Judith Gish, I believe, she, is she still here? Oh. Uh, my colleagues are the Appellate Division, First Department, my colleague on the Patent Jury Instruction Committee, Supreme Court of the State of uh, New York, and a past uh, award recipient from this organization. And also, uh, the Honorable Todd Tanisha James, 
judges talk, but lawyers talk. <laughs> and I heard through the grapevine that uh, my colleague is so loved in the guardianship community. Why is that? That's because not only of her intellect, but her compassion, her fairness, and also dispensing justice with mercy. So we want to recognize her as well. Last but not least, my mother, uh, Eleanor Kennedy, and let me say this, my mother is 80 years young, and, and, uh, and I always tell her age. The reason why I do that is because not only do I want you to see what 80 looks like, but also because it's truly a blessing to age. And as you read in the program, I'm the product of a single parent household. And my mother worked two jobs for me to realize that life existed beyond the Bronx mm -hmm. where I grew up. And I don't care what it was started running for civil court. And, and Judith Gish will tell you, um, she became my unofficial and unpaid campaign manager. <laughs> and whatever award it is, wherever I have to speak somewhere, my mother is there. So when you honor me, you're also honoring Eleanor and in quotes, Miss Ellie uh, Kennedy, who is the portrait of strength, the portrait of resilience, the portrait of love, compassion, tenacity, who told me that I could do whatever I wanted to do. And particularly, when the haters come, that's when you really, really show grace. So please, Mom, will you please stand so that everyone can see you. share this with you, that when my mother uh, entered corporate America, and for you American Express card holders, there was a time when you would write a check to American Express, and there were those called encoder operators. I served as an encoder operator in high school, where we would key in the amount. <laughs> And it would then go to quality control. I work there too. Quality control would balance the uh, amounts on that ticket tape with what quality control uh, did. I want you to know that my mother started her career off as an encoder operator, but left after traveling all across not only the nation, but the globe teaching other American Express staff about customer service. She was in the chairman's office. So that is what I bring, knowing that it's not about where you come from, but it is about education. It's about character, and it's about tenacity. Obviously, when we look at organizations, we have to look at leadership because the person or the persons who lead the organization, they set the tone for the organization. 
they create the culture of the organization. If you didn't know what the culture was before, you certainly know what the culture is today. And that is because of that impassioned speech we heard from Joy Solomon. And you're phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> and Why do I know that? When I became an acting Supreme Court Justice, first uh, learned about this esteemed organization. And I must say that I am humbled and, and, and honored and uh, had the pleasure of uh, having Deidre Lock, Dahlia Levine. Am I pronouncing that correctly? No, no, no. <laughs> Malia, Malia. Malia, I want to get it right. Okay, Malia, is it Levin? Okay, half right. I don't <laughs> mind being correct in my court. And I can tell you that always prepared. They were also passionate. And you, you saw the care. So, you know, I want to commend these two uh, ladies as well. It was always a pleasure, and I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Deidre's daughter, who looks just like, she's a mini Deidre. <laughs> and I said, you know, you should be proud of your mother because she was professional, she was respectful, and so uh, she's laying the groundwork for you, young lady, and I already know that you are going to be a superstar in your own right because of your of your mother. Listen, we see what the title is, but I want to put a subtitle, if I may. The Double T Breakfast. And the reason why I say the Double T Breakfast, Dr. Terry, Judge Tanya, we're both honorees. <laughs> I mean that in jest, but what can I say about you, Doctor? Phenomenal. What you are doing, a trailblazer in your own right. And obviously, you are paving the way. You made a great legacy. Why? Because of your twin <laughs> who followed your footsteps. So thank you for everything that you did during the pandemic, you're still doing. Uh, you're also a twin. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations to, to you, congratulations uh, to you. I just have to say a few more things, and I'm gonna take my seat. You know, uh, our society, we value youth, right? Everyone wants to look younger. We wanna get a tuck here, we wanna get Something lifted there. But I want to tell you, it's a blessing to age. It's a blessing. And I can honestly say that when I sat in that heart, it brought me joy. It brought me joy that I could play a role in restoring dignity to older persons, that I could also assist with providing a sense of security and belonging, but also that I could assist in letting them know that we see you and not invisible because you've heard this before. Many times people forget what you say, but they don't forget how you made them feel. So I'm honored that I was able to play a role. And I salute this esteemed organization because you're doing God's work and certainly uh, 
I have to give a shout out to Patricia Weiss, Pat Weiss. I know her from uh, Cardozo, who uh, has done a phenomenal uh, job uh, with this uh, <laughs> a fashionista. <laughs> but lastly, I just have to thank God. I wouldn't be standing here then if it wasn't for him. First of all, he woke me up. And you have to know that I'm a product of the black church. You have to know that. And anytime I wake up in the morning, seriously, I think part of this was from the guardianship. Uh, I say, thank you for waking me up. But thank you that I'm in my right mind, that I know who I am. Because many of the boys that came before me, they didn't know who they were. Thank you for letting me know where I am. Because many of the wards, they didn't know where they were. I want you to know that many of the wards that came before me, they had brilliant careers scientists, inventors, doctors, legends in the fashion world, et cetera, et cetera. They made their mark. They didn't know who they were. They didn't know where they were. But most importantly, I know whose I am. Why do I know that? Because during the pandemic, I was elevated. I was elevated to the appellate division. Let's just think about this for a second. A young lady from the Bronx. Uh, listen, the Bronx is moving up. Now they got lofts in the Bronx now. They got four thousand, et cetera. But there was a time when they said the Bronx was burning. Many of you in my generation, I'll be 55 years young, 4th of July. Uh, Bronx didn't have a good reputation, right? We're passing that now. That's where I come from. Born in the South Bronx, moved to the Northeast Bronx, a gunshot away. She's, I should say, a, excuse me, a stone throws away. That's how I'm from. Excuse me. I'm drinking decaf today, so we don't blame it on that. From Mount Vernon, that's just a cat. And a uh, single parent household. So, usually, right? Person of color, usually. You don't look like a judge. Oh, oh no. Yes, I do. This is what a judge looks like, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and to be elevated to one of the most esteemed courts, not only in the state of New York, but in the world. Oh, I, I, I give all praise. Mm -hmm. And the fact that during a pandemic, that all of us, all of us, uh, we were blessed to have jobs. We were blessed to have careers that we could work virtually from home. We have shelter. We have streaming services. We have food. We have family. We have wonderful professions, careers. <coughs> Most of all, we have life. So let's heed the call to what Vice President Solomon said about finding that passion, about self-care. And I have to say, whatever it is, whether it's the youth, or the, you know, whatever, whatever the issues are, they all circle back to being a champion, an elder, justice. And on that note, although I decide cases uh, with other colleagues, it's no more. It's my order. I'm going to pause today because I'm an honor bee. And I'm going to say, let's follow the heed of Vice President Solomon. And with that, that's an order. <laughs> Thank you.
champion of justice. Thank you so much on behalf of the Weinberg team. Thank you for your participation and for your support. If you're here as a guest of someone who is a supporter, I would invite you to join all of us in becoming supporters in your own right. And please, let's each take away from this breakfast the inspiration of Judge Kennedy and Dr. Fulmer and the determination of the Weinberg Center let us promise to take at least one action in support of older adults struggling with abuse. Let us help the Weinberg Center strengthen its life-saving work. On this World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, let us recommit to ensuring dignity and justice for older adults. Each of us has the power and the voice to make a difference. I leave you with these beautiful words and meaning of a haiku by Gary Snyder. After weeks of watching the roof leak, I fixed it tonight by moving a single board. Thank you so much.